Good morning, everyone. We, we were enjoying some uh, nice winter weather, but now, of course, Mother Nature is giving us a little warmer weather. I won't uh, be upset with that. That's one nice thing about uh, living in the Houston area. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to uh, Calculus 2. Uh, we have the advantage <clears throat> this semester of having a moderate, moderate size class, and that's actually very good. Um, large calculus classes can be uh, somewhat intimidating, and I want you to feel free to uh, be comfortable in the class and be able to take advantage of all the items on Blackboard and also uh, the conference hours. Uh, let me just go ahead and say something about that. Uh, you can check on my uh, Blackboard site in the syllabus. I will have uh, conference hours every day and I will send email invitations for those. That way, that way if you need uh, conference hours for a particular day during the week, uh, then it'll be in your inbox and you can just uh, click the, uh, the link uh, to that uh, particular Zoom conference. And what I've tried to do, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this semester is to have conference hours that are spread throughout the day. I actually do have some uh, two conference hours that will be in the evening just to accommodate those of you that may have work schedules or whatever. I think in the fall there were students that uh, uh, would have enjoyed maybe more flexibility. I, I had many office hours last fall, but there's always something that, that will keep someone from being able to attend. So hopefully this semester, uh, there'll be a flexible time for you to attend, uh, and I want you to take advantage of that. Let me just uh, first uh, share my screen. Um, let's see here. Uh, let me look here and see what we have. That's, that's calculus. So let me go over here to, let's see what I've got here. Uh, let me see if I can find this one second. I've got too many windows open and, and uh, Zoom doesn't like that. So let me try this again. Let's see here. There we go. Now, when it comes to your uh, Blackboard site, uh, this is the page that you'll spend most of your time. For instance, uh, your web assign is directly linked to uh, your Blackboard site and you've covered all of that. There, there uh, this is an open books plus section. And so when you're interested in accessing WebAssign, you can just click the WebAssign block here and it will take you directly to WebAssign. Here you can see the classes that I'm teaching. But the idea with the WebAssign is that I want to be able to give you a situation that makes your access very simple. Uh, clearly, uh, if you've used WebAssign before, you don't have to set up a new password or new username. Um, everything is set up to make it easy for you. And uh, also notice here, uh, every time that we have a lecture, it will be recorded. And so I will post the lecture recordings here with this tab. And that way, if you uh, find that you want to go back and review some items that I lectured on, or just to repeat an example for additional emphasis, you will always have that. And then, of course, there may be times you might be ill or you may have a, uh, another obligation uh, at, at your high school if you're uh, early college high school or dual credit. Things always come up. So I want to make sure that you always have access to this. And notice you have your assignments tab, which tells you what you'll be doing each week. Uh, also lecture notes that are my handwritten notes and also PowerPoints and even a tab for practice test uh, to give you an idea of basically what I will expect of you. I think that, that you are certainly aware of what goes on in a calculus class. Um, You've had uh, pre-calculus again, which is a very rigorous course, and you've had calculus one, uh, which kept you certainly very busy. And so what we want to do in calculus two 
is basically take all of the ideas that you've learned in pre-cal and calculus one and, and do more mathematics. We, we don't learn an excessive amount of new mathematics in calculus two. What we do is we take the ideas and we work with them to solve different kinds of problems through integration, learning new integration techniques, which you started in um, uh, calculus one. And then of course, taking the concept of the sequence and the infinite series from pre-cal to merge that into a theory uh, of infinitesimals that I think you will enjoy. And then of course, at the end of the class, we'll talk about some polar coordinates and their calculus and parametric equations. So, so this is what we call a great topics course that will undergird your work in future math classes and also your work in physics and engineering. Uh, of course, when you take your differential equations course, you'll be very happy uh, that you have taken uh, calculus too. So again, I want to welcome everybody. And now I've, I've got a nice little uh, document cam that I bought. Um, again, let me find it. I tell you, every the, the getting all of these things to work the way I want them is is sometimes difficult. My my document cam will appear and disappear at will at times. So let me get that up for you. I found this document camera in, in Japan last fall uh, when I was looking for document cams, there were none available in the United States. So that was, that was an interesting proposition. So here we go. And what's nice about the document cam, ladies and gentlemen, is that it basically provides me a whiteboard. I do have a Wacom tablet, but what's nice about the document cam is that it, it is the most, the closest facsimile that I can get to an actual uh, whiteboard. And I can adjust this however we like. Now, the first thing that we want to do today is to discuss inverse trig functions from a calculus standpoint. The idea here is that, and let me enlarge this just a little bit. Um, I've got, I don't like it looking kind of wonky like that. Let's see here. There we go and just there, that looks a little bit better. And let's see here, let me, bring this down some and let's see here. We're good on the ratio. Okay. So when it comes to calculus one at the very end, you probably spend a little bit of time on inverse hyperbolic functions and hyperbolic functions. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. That's a topic that I end when I teach calculus one. Uh, and so when we begin calculus two, we want to focus on the actual calculus of the inverse trig functions, which actually are a little bit more popular in engineering and mathematics. And so when you took your pre-calculus class, you spent quite a bit of time defining them, but thought they were somewhat mysterious. So what I want to do today is to take a little bit of opportunity to get into that idea and also to remind you of some things that may have become a little bit rusty. So in, for, for my first problem here, when you look at this, it says to find the inverse secant function. And what we're going to do is use the definition that our calculus book, Dr. Larson uh, uses. And so unfortunately with the inverse secant, that's why I'm starting with this, the definitions vary. There are two popular definitions that are used, and we just always need to be careful that we're aware of the definition uh, that the particular textbook uses. That's an unfortunate thing about mathematics, and you think all the mathematicians could get together and decide on one. So let's go ahead and write this down. I've decided to use a little bit of different approach. Uh, I, I vary this every time I teach the class, but I think uh, if I recall, you like your implicit differentiation. So we're gonna use some of that today. So for instance, we can say y 
equals the inverse secant. Now, in your calculus book, there will be two notations for the inverse trig functions. Some textbooks will use a minus one for the inverse secant, and Dr. Larson, he uses both, but he will also write arc secant for the inverse secant. I tend to focus more on this one, ladies and gentlemen, because of the minus one. That, that kind of illuminates the idea in your mind that you're working with the inverse function. And this is certainly a, 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 an acceptable notation. I just will not use it as often, but feel free to use this or the minus one in your web assign, however you type it and, and include your arguments is basically what web assign will be looking for. So if you, if you would prefer this over this, that's fine. That's completely up to you and I'll leave that to your judgment. Now, what we do when we think about this, we're thinking, okay, we had to restrict this function to make it work. So what did that mean? In this particular case, this would say that X in absolute value was greater than or equal to one. Now, one thing we can do is we can, we can flesh out the absolute value. We could say X in this particular infinite set, negative infinity to negative one, union one to infinity. And similarly, the Y or the inverse secant, there would be a range, so to speak. And this looked like this. That is, we would run from zero to pi, but we would exclude the pi over two due to the uh, vertical asymptote in the secant function. So I'm sure this is probably a little rusty, but as you work through uh, these sections in, uh, in your calculus book, all of this will come back and, and you'll feel professional again. Okay, now when we think about this, we know that this particular set of real numbers gives us what we call a one-to-one -one function. This was the restriction. This is, this is a standard restriction. And also I want to make you aware of the Wikipedia uh, inverse trig page. It's an excellent page with many, many good identities and many of the properties of the inverse trig functions. I know Wikipedia sometimes gets a bad rap, but it's a free information society. And I do contribute to it at times. It, it provides really good information. Uh, and like I say, uh, the, the internet is, is a wealth of information. But, but anytime you're working in a physics class and you need an identity, uh, you can always check out the a Wikipedia inverse trig page. Now, if we require a picture of this, we can remind ourselves basically what this function looks like in terms of a graph. And so now we can mark off the pi over two the vertical asymptote becomes a horizontal asymptote in the inverse function. Good old pre-calculus. And let me, let me silence my, um, email. Here we, that's one thing with the zoom. We don't want a lot of clutter with noise. Okay, and now let's go ahead and mark off the pi. And then we have our one and minus one. And so we have our one, zero, which then approaches pi over two, 
So we're going to get two branches that look very familiar to us. And then, of course, the negative one pi. So the one thing about this particular description of the inverse secant function is that it's an increasing function. There's certain attributes that are good for this particular description. So we get these two branches here that again, at least from looking at it, even though that's not a proof, we have a nice increasing function. So this is our, I'll just go ahead and write this in red, y equals the inverse secant of x. And now, just like we learned in pre-calculus when we deal with inverse functions, the inverse function is implicit in the sense that it also defines another function. So equivalently, if we apply the secant function uh, to this equation, we get x equals secant y. We're now we think of as y as a differentiable function of x. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here, this is basically the inverse function theorem at work, but I'm trying to showcase this in a way that will allow you to use your implicit differentiation. So when you look in the notes, you'll actually see a statement of the inverse function theorem. So it'll give you another perspective at looking at these types of arguments. So one nice thing about calculus is it's very flexible. And so not one particular argument is the only argument. And certainly, however you choose to fashion your arguments, as long as you use legitimate mathematics, you're, you're in good stead. So, so always remember flexibility is, is, is not a bad thing. So what we can do is differentiate implicitly. So we can differentiate x with respect to x to get one. And then the derivative of the secant function is secant tangent. I do this one first because it's the most involved and then it makes the remaining ones look very simple. And then of course, dy dx or y prime. So we utilize the fact that we understand the calculus of the secant function from calculus one. And so now we can, if you will, again, with no division by zero, uh, divide both sides by secant y, uh, tangent y. So dy dx, which would be the representation for the derivative of the inverse secant function would be at least implicitly one divided by secant y, tangent y. Now, of course, that's a formula, but it's really not the best formula because we really would like our formula to be in the independent variable x. Uh, one reason I'm doing it this way is to make it a little bit easier on you with the x's and y's. When we deal with inverse functions, we really do need to know where the x's and y's live so we don't get confused as to what we're actually working with. And so now when you look at this, you're thinking these are gonna be compositions of trig functions with inverse trig functions because we know y is the inverse uh, secant of x. So we can make a substitution and then we will unravel this. So this will give us one. And if you like, uh, I'll go ahead and draw a little triangle over here from our equation here. We have secant of y and secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So this would be x and a one. And then of course that would leave 
by the Pythagorean theorem, the square root of x squared minus one for the remaining leg. So it's always nice to have a nice right triangle to, to give us uh, the other trig functions uh, in, in a very simple way. So again, we have this. Now we can look at this as something that will help us out. But at this point, we're thinking, okay, well, secant y, what is that? Well, secant y is just plain old x, or we could make a, a substitution either way. So since I bothered to draw this triangle, the secant y is just x. Just make it a little bit easier. And then now tangent y, we can just see as opposite over adjacent. That is the square root of x squared minus one. Now, when we look at this, we need to think about uh, some, what we've done here. Okay, so when I've done this, I've made certain assumptions here. I've simplified it, but I've made some assumptions. So for instance, when we have a positive X here, we know that the Y, the secant Y is between zero and pi over two. So this would be X greater than one. And then of course, when we look at this, we think, okay, well, we've got a tangent of Y and that for those particular values of the uh, y here, zero to pi over two, we have what we call a positive radical. So this is fine with the sign convention as long as our x's live here, okay? And that's what we tacitly assume. Again, we have to be a little bit more careful, even though I've got this nice little triangle here, I can't just wave the signs away. And now, of course, we have the situation where x will be less than negative one. So let's write that in. Of course, in this case, x is less than zero. We still have the same thing. But now, in this particular case, the value of y, the inverse secant, lies between pi over two and pi, where the tangent function is negative if we think of our unit circle. So we would have to affix the appropriate sign uh, for our radical here, since the radical is always non-negative. So in this case, we have X, but now we have the negative of the square root of X squared minus one. So this is a lot of pre-cal that I'm sure has gotten a little bit rusty. And that's why I like to start with this one, because if you can do this problem, then the others are simple. Now, the nice thing about this is that we don't have to settle with a formula in two pieces. Notice here that since the X here is less than zero, we can actually move the negative here. And then the additive inverse of X would actually be the absolute value of X. Here, the absolute value of X is just plain old X. And so what we can do here to consolidate both of these is just replace the X with its absolute value. So let me just do one more step here. So that'll be perfectly clear. So we have one X square root X squared minus one where X is greater than one. Of course, we had to leave out the one and the negative one because we have vertical tangents here. We get division by zero. So, so we, we lost a couple of points in our derivative. And now we can just remove the negative to pair up with the X. So in either case, now we see that X can be replaced with its absolute value because here when X is less than negative one, the additive inverse of X is its absolute value. And clearly here X is positive, so X can be replaced with its absolute value. So this means we can, what we call consolidate. 
And therefore, instead of a function in two pieces, we can write one divided by the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus one. Of course, let's see here. Let me make sure I've got this right. The Weber sign always times out, you know, security is important. So, so what we can see here, even though we had to work a little bit harder, you're thinking, well, that's kind of a pesky formula, Professor Ron. We look at this and say, well, you know, I've got absolute value in my derivative formula, but we kind of need it. And then of course, there's certain identities that we get by defining the inverse uh, secant function this way, which actually turns out to be good for us. So, so now what we can see, if, if we just simply replace um, x with u, a, a differentiable function of x, that is a chain rule extension, we can have a nice derivative formula for the inverse secant. So to take this and move it forward a little, first we will suppose, so you can get a nice general formula. Suppose u is our favorite variable, right? U, suppose u is a differentiable function of x. Again, this is a little bit particular, but not overly difficult when you think about the way we define these functions, always keeping track of the signs. Suppose u is a differentiable function of x, then we can take what we derived here and just say that the derivative of the inverse secant or arc secant of u can now be written uh, with the chain rule extension. So we have one, and I'll just go ahead and put u prime upstairs to consolidate. Remember, we always have to multiply by the derivative of the inner function. So I can just replace the one with dy or du dx or uh, u prime. Absolute value of u square root u squared minus one. So here's a nice chain rule extension for our inverse secant. And remember, remember also, just to remind you, if you like, this goes for all the inverse trig functions. We can write inverse secant as arc secant. It really just depends what you like. Some students like the inverse symbolism, other students like this. Sometimes your physics professors will use one or the other. Uh, it just really depends what their, their uh, uh, choice is. So again, uh, feel free to use whichever notation uh, helps you to remember. So, so what we want to do, at least for today, is when we get a nice derivative formula, and we'll do some practice examples with this, is we want to get the corresponding uh, antiderivative formula because we, you know, we want to get more bang for the buck and, and move these formulas out as much as we can. So we can make some simple observations. Like again, like I say, we start with this function because it's the most involved and it makes the remainders very, very simple. So I want you to be aware that mastery of this function will help you to master the inverse sine and the inverse tangent. And there, I'm gonna show you a little trick as to why we don't have to find the calculus of all six inverse trig functions. There's a, there's a nice identity uh, going on that allows us to do a lot less work. Okay, so let's see what we can get from this. Now I always update the uh, the web assigned. So if new people have come into the class, then I will definitely update the web assigned. So you'll see your web assigned uh, when you access it. We we often have 
new members joining the class during the lecture. So give me an opportunity to update after our lecture is over today. If you've checked WebAssign and don't see your name in the roster, I will, I will fix that. Now what we want to do is make the following observation. And in the first case, what we want to do is take the case where u is greater than one and look at the following, d dx of the inverse secant <clears throat> of the absolute value of u. Okay, so in this particular case, we're thinking, oh, well, this is what you were talking about uh, with um, the restrictions on X, and now they become restrictions on U. So what we want to do is to say, okay, if U is greater than one, then its absolute value is just U. So we have D DX inverse secant of U, And now when we actually look at this, we say, okay, well, let's take the derivative but that we just arrived, and this will be one u, absolute value of u, again, uh, the u here in this particular case uh, is, is greater than one, so we can leave out the absolute value, and we get u squared minus one. U prime. And now let's try another case. So this is case one and then case two. Let's assume the other case U less than negative one. So we have D DX of the inverse secant of the absolute value of u. And now we can replace u with its additive inverse. So we have d dx. We could use some other identities, but we'll stick with this. Negative u. And so now we can apply our formula so this will give us one. So we have negative u, its absolute value. And then when we square the negative u, we just get the u squared minus one. And then we have negative u prime. Of course, the derivative is linear. The negatives are actually factor and then the negatives will absorb. So we get a negative one U prime. And then of course we have the negative U downstairs, U squared minus one. And of course the negatives absorb and we get one divided by U times U squared minus one U prime. So what we've seen here is that our integral formulas will actually have an absolute value in the antiderivative by the observations that we have here. So now we can work these problems backwards. So this would say equivalently that the integral of du u times the square root of u squared minus one will now be the inverse secant of the absolute value of u plus a constant, okay? Now you're thinking, all right, well, I, I see what you're saying, Professor Ron. Now that we understand this inverse secant derivative, again, using the definition and then making some observations having to do with the absolute value, 
we've got a nice integral formula, but this is, this is not what we want. We, we want more user-friendly. And when I mean user-friendly, this is not the way the formula is stated in your integral table. We want to introduce a positive number A to make our integral formulas even more flexible. So now we want to fix a positive A and suppose that now we can have U over A greater than one. We would need this. And so this is what we want to do to extend our integral formulas to make them even more user friendly. So what does this give us? Then we have D U over A and then we have U over A And then of course, u squared becomes u squared over a squared. We just do a replacement minus one to the one half. So we just do a replacement of u with u over a to make our formula more user friendly. Okay, so now of course we can utilize the linearity of the differential operator. So that'll give us a one over a. So we have one over a du. And now, if you like, we can collect these downstairs. Notice that here we have a 1 over 1 over a. So we can go ahead and bring that a outside right here. And this will give us a u. And then we can get a common denominator, u squared minus a squared over a squared to the one half. Now notice we're getting some nice absorption. So notice here the one over a and the a will absorb. I use that instead of cancel du. And then we have u. Again, the square root of a squared is the absolute value of a, but a is positive. So this will give us a u over a, u squared minus a squared to the one half. We do these derivations when we start the class. We don't always have time to be as rigorous because we get so many subjects in this class to teach, but it's important to start out rigorous so you understand what's going on here so you can appreciate it as we move into other techniques of integration. So now, of course, we've got the one over one over a bit. So the a pulls out. So this will be a times the integral du u square root u squared minus a squared. But by what we've done here, this is actually inverse secant of u over a. Of course, we don't have to put the absolute value on the a if you don't want, but it's okay. It's not gonna change anything. And we'll just say plus a c1. And then now we can divide by a. So equivalently, the integral du u square root u square minus a square divided by a. So this will be one over a inverse secant or arc secant. And again, you can apply the absolute value to the entire fraction or just remove it from the A, it doesn't matter. Then plus a C, so we're gonna call C1 divided by A just plain old C as an arbitrary constant. So we'll just say where C equals C1 over A. Because we just like to write our arbitrary constants as A. So now we have a more user-friendly formula that would 
would turn up in the integral table. So these formulas are a little bit more involved, but since they occur so often in mathematics, uh, we spend some time on them. So now, as opposed to stopping with this formula, we now have a formula that's even better. So for a fixed A, this allows us to look for this form. And if we have this form, then we can pick off the U, so to speak, figure out the DU and, and determine the A from the A squared term, and then write the antiderivative. So this is, again, an elementary form, but, but not a form that we spent much time on in the uh, first calculus class, calculus one. So, so again, we don't stop here, we stop here to give a more user-friendly formula. So let's now look at the uh, remaining two, and then we can uh, do some examples with some derivatives. So what I want to do today is not only get the derivative formula as we have here, the derivative formula, but also get the corresponding antiderivative formula made more user-friendly. Now, like I said before, when it comes to the calculus, you're thinking, well, you know, we do inverse secant function. What about inverse cosecant? Well, I'll, I'll share with you why we don't have to do that one uh, because of the, of the identities. But if you go to your Wikipedia page, and this is interesting, um, we want to just observe observe the following. This is why we don't have extra integral uh, formulas in our integral tables. For instance, we know that the inverse cosecant of x is just in this particular case, pi over two minus the inverse secant of x. So this is an inverse trig identity. And when we look at this, we just basically see if we differentiate here that we will get the negative of the derivative of the inverse secant. So there's nothing new here. We don't, we don't have to write another formula because we see that the derivative of the inverse secant function is just the negative of the derivative of the inverse secant. So this implies that d dx of cosecant inverse of some differentiable function of x u will just be the negative of the inverse secant of u. And let me just write this here. I'll just, so I don't have to write down the, the formula. Let me, let me let, put a little more space here. This will just be the negative of the derivative right there. So, so again, we don't learn, we don't really have any new mathematics because this is true. When we take the derivative here, we're just left with the derivative of the additive inverse of inverse secant, which we have right here. So, so that's why we don't spend time with additional integral formulas because they only differ by negatives. And the same is true for inverse cosine and inverse cotangent, we have the same type of identity. So it doesn't mean that Professor Ron is getting lazy and saying, don't worry about this, ladies and gentlemen, we don't need to. And so you're only going to see formulas for the inverse secant antiderivative and not for the inverse uh, cosecant because of the similarity between the calculus that we see uh, from this identity right here. So what we see when we're actually doing calculus is that sometimes we actually have less work to do 
because of the way the arithmetic works out for us. Now, let's look at some other examples. So again, this was kind of to get you going with the calculus here in a way that will help you to understand that everything we're doing is based on what you learned in your pre-calculus course. So what have we really done today? We basically just focused on pre-calculus techniques with a little bit of calculus with implicit differentiation. So now what we can do is consider the inverse sine function. So this will be number two. So we're gonna say why, and of course this will go a lot easier and you're gonna breathe a sigh of relief. Y will be the inverse sine of X. Now, again, we need to remind ourselves, how did we define this function uh, back in pre-calculus to make it one-to-one? -one? So in this particular case, we had X to live between negative one and one. And of course, the Y or the inverse sine in this case of x, will live between negative pi over two and pi over two. Now it turned out that the inverse sine function is actually an odd function. The inverse secant is not. I mean, there's an identity of the negative argument, um, but, but it, it's just that we don't get good in all cases. <laughs> So now when you think about this, you're thinking, oh, because this was the first function we did back in pre-cal, what did the graph look like if we use these uh, parameters here? If you recall, we got a nice increasing function, just like we did with the inverse secant. And so if you will, you can mark off your pi over two and your negative pi over two, just like you did in pre-cal, in order to work with the inverse trig functions, you need to know the definitions. And without it, it, life gets a little bit difficult. We can't work with the inverse trig functions if we don't know how they're defined. So we have a negative one and we have a one. And so I'll use red so we had the negative one, negative pi over two, and we had the positive one, pi over two. Got a nice vertical tangent there. So these are interesting functions to say the least. And we do these in the abstract. I mean, when we define the inverse sine functions, we don't define them in terms of a formula, which it's an abstraction based on the unit circle. And so unlike the hyperbolic functions that have formulas based on exponentials, we don't have the same luxury with the inverse trig function. So we really have to develop them through the geometry that we used to introduce them um, in uh, pre-cal. And then of course the, the calculus and the infinite series representations will again be another mystery uh, when we work through that. So this will be y equals inverse sine of x. Now, of course, if you like, you can write this as the arc sine as an alternative arc sine, your choice. I, again, I like the I like the minus one notation, but I will certainly leave that up to you. I'll go ahead and refocus here. Now, just like we had before, we're interested in a derivative formula, which we can easily get. Now, what we can say is equivalently, we can apply the sine function to the first equation, that is x will equal sine of y. But the function, inverse sine function is not nearly as complicated as the inverse secant. Um, but, but the formula that we used 
uh, for inverse seek and actually uh, validates the reciprocal identity that makes computation easier. So, so at least in this case, we don't have to work as hard. So now what we'll do is just assume y is a differentiable function of x. I avoided doing the compositions by going ahead and drawing the triangle, but we still saw with the inverse secant that we had to be careful with signs uh, because of the distribution of the values of the inverse secant. But now just to work along the same lines here, we can draw a triangle based on this equation. Triangles will be very useful to us and we certainly don't want to downplay their importance. So why, of course, uh, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So this will be x over one here, the hypotenuse one. And then by the Pythagorean theorem, we will get one minus x squared square root. Now, if you like, we can differentiate implicitly. So differentiate x with respect to x gives us a one. And then of course, the derivative of sine, how simple, cosine y dy dx. So we're having the same uh, setup as we did with the inverse secant, but a much simpler derivative. So a lot less work to do. So now, of course, as long as we don't divide by zero, we have a formula for the derivative, at least symbolically, of the inverse sine. Again, we had to work a lot harder in the previous case. You'll see how this one's much simpler. Now, notice what's interesting here is when we think about where y lives, these are values of long as we uh, avoid the endpoints because we don't want to divide by zero. This gives us the fourth quadrant and the first quadrant where the cosine function is positive. So we don't have the sine uh, alternation that we had with the inverse secant function. So now we can say this will preserve sine, that is we're not gonna have a function in two parts. And then of course, for the cosine y, we just have adjacent over hypotenuse. And, and again, that's nice because this gives us one divided by the square root of one minus x squared and the sign is preserved. So we have correct signs. Again, the values of y live here where the cosine function is, is non-negative. So, so excellent. So now, now when we look at this, again, we notice that we get rid of the one and the minus one because we have what appears to be vertical tangents at those points. So we do, again, lose a couple of points in the set of differentiability, but I think we're okay with that. We still have infinitely many to deal with. So now what we can do is suppose, suppose u is a differentiable function of x, suppose, excuse me, suppose u is a differentiable function of x, then we can do the chain rule extension, the derivative with respect to x of inverse sine of u or arc sine, again, you can use arc sine, will now be u prime square root one minus u squared. So now we're seeing that we get a nice chain rule extension formula. These are odd, but, but again, the formulas that tell you exactly how you differentiate them. And so that gives you, that gives you the means to take derivatives. This is not differentiating a polynomial or a quotient rule. There's a definite formula here. Uh, so you figure out the u, you square the u, subtract it from one, square root it, and then hit it with the u prime. So the formula is very direct. And as you work with these more and more, they'll become uh, a lot more uh, part of your vocabulary. Now, like we said before, 
we don't have to work as hard here. We don't have that pesky absolute value. So we can make a user-friendly uh, uh, anti-derivative formula. And notice here, uh, in this particular case, we have u is less than one. Uh, in absolute value, because we don't want to divide by uh, zero. So now, just like we had before, we want to fix A positive. And suppose, take this idea, replace U with U over A. Suppose U over A is less than one. So again, we want another user-friendly formula so we can make the, the observation here uh, that we had before. So for instance here, notice, let me just go ahead before I proceed with this, let me go ahead and write this out. So we have du integral one minus u squared is just inverse sine of u plus a constant like we had before but we don't wanna stop with that. We wanna use this to get the more user-friendly form formula. So I didn't mean to leave that out. I was thinking maybe by now that's kind of obvious, but we have this formula, which comes directly from this. And so now let's make it even better. So then we have the integral, the derivative of u over a, the differential, and then I'll use brackets here. We have one minus u squared over a squared to the one half. And now we can use the fact that the differential is linear, pull out the one over a. So we have one over a du. And then of course downstairs, we'll get a squared minus u squared over a squared all raised to the one half. Now the one over a comes out. And then of course downstairs we have the square root of a squared which is the absolute value of a which again is just a because a is positive. So we get one over a square root a squared minus u squared. But notice now the one over a is absorbed. So, wow, no, nothing difficult here. So we have du over a squared minus u squared. And now we can use this formula and this will just be equal to inverse sine of u over a plus a constant. So now I can summarize this. So what we're saying here is we didn't have to work nearly as hard with the constants in this particular case. So now we see that the integral du divided by the square root of a squared, where a squared is the fixed real number, u squared, will be inverse sine or arc sine of u over a plus a constant. So here's another formula that goes into your integral table that'll get plenty of use. Again, notice with the inverse secant, we had the uh, one over a uh, factor, which we don't have with the inverse sine. So, so again, unless you're doing a problem where the, the factor uh, occurs as part of uh, adjusting an integrand, uh, you don't have the same one over a that you had with the inverse secant formulation with the antiderivative. So again, if you look in your standard integral table, this will be one of the standard integral formulas. These gets, get lots of play in, in calculus and physics and engineering, and that's why we're studying them today. So again, the, the goal here, after we got the derivative formula that you notice here, 
is a user-friendly formula that again is more applicable. Again, when, when you look at integral tables, this is not something that came up uh, you know, in 30 seconds. Integral tables and formulas are, are investigated and modified over time. And so that gives you a better source of knowledge. Um, you know, we, we, we are so grateful for all the great minds that preceded us that we can actually study mathematics in a form that is uh, quite user-friendly. You may not agree with that, but, but we are certainly much better off than, than our predecessors before good notation was introduced and, and everyone at least knew what the definition of a function was. Okay, so now the very last one, and let me just remind you here again, um, observe that inverse cosine of X, again, this is another identity that I have here, is equal to pi over two minus inverse sine of X. So you get the same situation. The derivative of inverse cosine is just the negative of the derivative of inverse sine. So again, just like we had before, the derivative, and I'll use the U's now, for u a differentiable function of x will just be the negative of the derivative of the inverse sine. Here, let me not do secant, inverse sine or arc sine. So they just differ by negatives. So again, we don't have extra, we don't have extra formulas uh, to clutter up our work. Again, by this identity, we get this fact. So we don't need additional formulas here. It'd just be a waste of time. They only differ by negative. So I thought I would add this uh, just to save you the fact that you don't have to, you know, do all of these derivations. Sometimes I'll just say, well, kids, the here's the only difference. Don't worry about it. But but sometimes it's nice just to have an equation or an identity that that kind of takes care of it right away. And, and so if you did a derivative uh, for the inverse cosine, you just think formula for the inverse sine and slap a negative on it. So no new mathematics to, to keep you up at night. Okay, and the very last one that we want to do is the inverse tangent. So we have y equals inverse tangent of x. Now, I left this one for last because it's one of the most uh, studied uh, inverse trig functions. And also it's probably the most user-friendly because its integral formula has no radicals in it, which I'm sure you're like, hallelujah, uh, we, can, we can take a break from the Pythagorean uh, uh, integrands. So, so in this case, we say, all right, well, this was a very user-friendly function. X can be any real number infinity, negative infinity to infinity. And then of course, the inverse tangent, when we think of that principal branch, lives between negative pi over two and pi over two. Again, we'll use the inverse trig functions when we talk about trigonometric substitution and in integral techniques. So we'll have plenty of opportunities to use inverse trig functions in this class. Uh, this is where you, you really are glad that you took uh, pre-cal. So we, we're seeing that as evidenced by what we're doing today. So now let's just go ahead and draw a picture of this. I would like you to know these functions. Um, you know, you can always get the other ones using uh, these uh, nice identities here. Again, that's just a little extra thing I wanted to add this time. And so now we can mark off our horizontal asymptotes, pi over two and negative pi over two. So this is, this is a very popular function in probability and statistics. A lot of you all will go on 
to take some probability theory at the university. And this looks like a, a cubic equation. Again, we don't have the, the vertical tangent there. Again, you know a lot of the properties and the values from the unit circle. So this is y equals <clears throat> inverse tangent of x or arc tan of x, arc tan. That's another way to write it. A lot of, a lot of uh, mathematicians like to say arc tan, you know, so maybe that's more popular for them, but inverse tangent, arc tan, um, again, I like to focus on the inverse part. So I'll say the inverse tangent function, just to focus on the fact that we are dealing with an inverse function, a one-to-one -one function. Um, but again, just be aware that you have flexibility with the notations that you use. So now, equivalently, we can apply a tangent to this equation. So this will give us x equals tangent of y. Again, where y is a differentiable function of x. So now what we can see in this particular case is that we can now do the implicit differentiation like we did before. Now you're professionals at this. So the derivative of x with respect to itself will be one. And of course the derivative of tangent is the secant squared. And then of course dy dx. Or if you like, we can just say secant y quantity squared dy dx. And now of course we can solve for dy dx and just get one divided by secant y quantity squared. I'm doing it this way so it makes the algebra a little bit easier to see. And of course now we can draw our triangle keeping track of where the x's and the y's live. So again, the tangent of y uh, here will be opposite over adjacent. So this will be x over one. And then of course, we get one squared plus x squared square root using the Pythagorean theorem. So again, the, the way we've defined our trig functions makes this analysis rather straightforward. As long as we maintain a uh, sign convention, we're, we're in good shape. So now what we can see, and this is uh, the secant y will just be uh, hypotenuse over adjacent. That'll be the square root of one plus x squared, but we see that radical will absorb. So we get the square root of one plus x squared. And again, note, for the y's living here, the secant function is non-negative. So we get the correct sign. We don't have to worry about a plus or a minus as we did with the uh, inverse secant function. So again, we, we have a very nice definition which lends for uh, the generation of correct signs. So of course, when we square here, we remove the radical. So again, like I said before, I promised that we would have a inverse uh, tangent derivative that had no radical in it. So now we can say, suppose u is a differentiable function of x. u is a differentiable function of x. Then we have our nice chain rule extension, d dx of the inverse tangent or the arctan of u will now just be u prime divided by one plus u squared. 
So here's our chain rule extension. And then of course, this would imply that's not extended by the constant A would say that the integral du one plus u squared would just be the inverse tangent of u, the arctan plus a constant. So that's good, but that's not what we see in the integral table. So we'll do the same song and dance. And then after that, we'll do some examples of this. And you'll have plenty of opportunities to get your feet wet with your web assigned problems. And of course, if you have any uh, questions that you can, you can come to my uh, conference hours. Um, but again, let's do the same thing we did before with the other uh, inverse trig function derivatives and integrals. So now, hopefully this is bringing all of this back and that maybe it wasn't so cloudy the first time, it doesn't make sense. But now when you see it in the context of calculus, it's like, wow, I, that makes sense now. I, you know, I just thought this was just something our professor made up just to give us a hard time. But now we're seeing that there's some very beautiful calculus uh, with the inverse trig functions. And so now uh, fix, a in the real, well, we'll say a real number, but we're going to fix it to be positive. No need to change it up now. Fix A positive. And then we want, in this case, we've just got, there are no restrictions on U, uh, so we don't have to have a restriction on U over A. So then we can have the, the inverse tangent function is just too good to us. I, we don't get used to this. So we have what u over a, and then we have uh, one plus u squared over a squared, just the substitution. Then of course the differential is linear. So we get one over a du, and then we can get a common denominator a squared plus u squared, no radicals, almost like we're making it up. So now we have one over a du. And then of course here, this is one over one over a. So that's gonna be just an, an a squared. So let me make some room for that. So that's just going to be an a squared one over one over a squared. So we can go ahead and move that outside too, if you like, just to save a little bit of time. So again, the one over a factors and one over one over a squared is just a squared. And so now this just gives us what a du a squared plus u squared. And by our derivative formulation, this is inverse tangent of u over a plus, we'll just call it c1 for now, and then we can divide by a. So equivalently, we have the integral du a squared plus u squared. So divide by a, so this gives us one over a inverse tangent u over a. And then of course, we'll divide c1 by a and just call it c. And I'll just say uh, c1 over a equals c. So this is the formula that we find again in our integral table. So you've got three new integral formulas and three new derivative formulas actually six, but but they're they're just negatives. And like I said before, um, we have the uh, inverse cotangent of x equals pi over two. These are all from the Wikipedia page. And, and what's nice about all of these is that they're easy to remember. You may have talked about these in uh, pre-cal in passing. And if not, you, you know them now. 
So again, we have this, which implies just the negative between the, the derivatives. So this implies again that uh, the derivative of inverse cotangent of u will use a differentiable function of x will just be the negative of the derivative of the inverse tangent of u. So no new calculus, just they differ by negative signs. Again, using the nice identity here, as you differentiate, this is zero. So we just get negative of the derivative of the inverse tangent. So that, that might be a more soothing reason as to why we don't focus on this. And many times I thought this was obvious, but as I've taught more and more pre-cal, the, the students, you know, like I say, they're, they're so mind blown with inverse trig functions the first time they see them that, that, that certain things that you think stick don't. And so absolutely, it's always nice to think about something and, and just, again, breathe a sigh of relief. Now, let's look at some examples. Now that we've got these nice formulas, let's look at some examples of some of the calculus here. Now, one thing that's interesting about a lot of these problems, some of the problems are just really, really simple, but I just want to do uh, a couple of, of derivative formulas. Just get some practice with that. Remind you of some things you did back in Cal 1, and then maybe do a couple of integrals. And then of course, next time we meet, we'll do some more integrals and spend some time on, um, let's see, let me adjust this chair a little bit. There we go. I don't like to throw out my, being, being a tall person, if you don't put your writing right in front of you, you can dislocate your shoulder and that, that's not very comfortable. So let's look here. Here's an example. Uh, and it's the following example says to do this, compute the derivative. Compute derivative. So we had a lot of stuff that we had to kind of iron out. We don't normally have to spend that much time with the theory, but these are important topics that we need to know. So we're gonna say y is equal to three halves times the quantity, one half natural log of x plus one divided by x minus one plus the inverse tangent <clears throat> of x. Again, you can write it as arctan or tan minus one x. Now, when we look at this and we think about what we're doing, what I want to do is use some of your properties uh, back in calculus one. Uh, not required, but we all often think of identities as being kind of the linchpin of our existence uh, because without them, we have to work a lot harder. So what we can do is we can multiply through here and then use some properties of the logarithm to make the differentiation simpler, just like you did in calculus one. So let's just work on why a little bit. So first, the three halves times the one half, that's gonna be three quarters natural log x plus one, x minus one, plus three halves inverse tangent of x. Now, the next thing I want to do is to look at this as the log of a quotient and write it as the difference of two logs. So we have three quarters, and I'll just put parentheses here. I'll have natural log of x plus one minus, of course, this is in parentheses, minus natural log of x minus one plus three halves inverse tangent of x. So again, we haven't done any calculus except use what you already knew in calculus one and pre-cal. 
And now that we have done today's lecture, we know how to differentiate this. So now that we've simplified this a little bit, the derivative should be a little bit easier. So now then we say y prime and using linearity, we just have three quarters. And then of course the derivative of ln of x plus one will just be one over x plus one. And then we have minus the derivative of ln of x minus one. So that'll be one over x minus one. Now plus three halves, and now we can use the derivative of the inverse tangent of x. That will be, again, the u is x, and so d, uh, du is dx. That is, we just get a one. So we get one over one plus x squared. Again, notice here that, that we have a very simple situation when it comes to these two guys here. Again, using the derivative formulas from calculus one and now using the derivative formula uh, based upon our derivation with the inverse tangent. So now, if you like, we can go ahead and clean this up a little bit. We have three quarters. So we have one over one plus X. And now here, if you like, you can just run the negative through here to get plus one divided by one minus X. That just seems to be a simple way here. If we run the negative in, we can reverse uh, the X minus one to one minus X plus three halves times one over one plus X squared. So now we can get common denominators. We've got a three in everything, but let's not worry about it so much. So again, the product here, one plus X times one minus X, that's a difference of two squares. So that's one minus X squared. And then of course now common denominator, we'll get a one <coughs> minus X times a one plus a one plus X. with a common denominator plus three halves times one over one plus X squared. And now of course, the X and the minus X absorb and we're left with a two, one plus one, two over one minus X squared plus three halves times one divided by one plus X squared. And now of course the two here will absorb. So we have a three halves multiplying both terms. So we have, we can go ahead and factor that three halves. So we have one <clears throat> divided by one minus X squared plus one divided by one plus X squared. Now, of course, the, this algebra is nice and convenient and in most problems, the algebra doesn't come out this beautifully, but now we can get another common denominator. Again, we've got a difference of two squares, one minus X squared times one plus X squared would just be one minus X to the fourth difference of two squares again. So this gives us three halves. So this is just an algebra exercise really. So we have one minus X to the fourth let me just write the identity I keep using, one minus X squared times one plus X squared is just one minus X to the fourth, difference of squares. And so now with the common denominator, we get a one plus X squared, and then we get plus a one minus X squared, same difference. So again, the X squareds absorb. And so we have three halves times two over one minus X to the fourth. And then of course the twos absorb and we get three 
divided by one minus x to the fourth. Now, one thing about the work that we do in calculus two, like in calculus one, we usually involve lots of algebra and lots of arithmetic just because of the nature of what we're doing. So there'll be times when it's like, well, all this was was a bunch of algebra. But when we work with integrals and we work with applications of the definite integral and infinite series, we will do a lot of manipulation with algebra. And so it's good just to practice. And even though it is somewhat dry and boring, um, as, as future STEM professionals in your physics and engineering classes, uh, you'll be doing some of the same stuff. So, so there's just a practice uh, using some of our new uh, derivatives, uh, very simple. It's like that got left in the, in the dust and the rest was just basic algebra, but important algebra. Okay, now there's some examples here uh, from uh, one using the inverse sine function that I just want to get a little bit of practice with. And then we'll look at some integrals. This is the equation of a tangent line. So here's an example. So let's see, uh, let me write this down. So we have compute equation of the tangent line, equation of the tangent line. And here's the function. We have y equals three times the inverse secant or arc, excuse me, inverse sine, arc sine inverse sine at the point one half pi over two. Now, one thing that we want to look at here and, and notice about uh, this particular function, um, one thing we can see here is that when, when, you, when you actually compute this, you know, just, just practice a little bit with your pre-calculus here. Uh, inverse sine of one half is pi over six. And of course, three times pi over six gives us pi half. So this should remind you of the unit circle uh, when you actually were introduced to inverse trig functions. So again, nothing new here, maybe just a little bit rusty. And just like with the problems that you did in Cal 1, you know, you, you first have to start with a point on the curve and then you want to construct the tangent line to the curve at that point if the derivative exists. So you can't just say, well, maybe it doesn't exist. So in most cases, however, when, when you're uh, uh, requested to compute a tangent line, the derivative at the given point uh, will exist. Uh, that would be unfortunate otherwise, but, but just remember if you're working a physics or a, a engineering problem, uh, your model may not work at a particular point. So now, but basically in this particular case, we just want a, uh, y equal mx plus b form. Usually in your web assign, you might have something like y equals, and you'll have a box. And basically when it's written that way, you just want an mx plus b form, just like you did in calculus one. So first, let's just go ahead and apply uh, the calculus here. So y prime will just be the derivative with respect to x of three times the inverse sine of x. Again, the derivative is linear, so the three factors. And then of course, the derivative of the inverse sine as we derive is one divided by the square root of one minus x squared. And of course, the derivative of x being one. So this is just like the inverse tangent of x. So this gives us three 
divided by the square root of one minus x squared. So now we can, this is not an implicit equation, so this implies our slope m will just be y prime evaluated at one half. So we get three. And so this will be a one. Again, when we have one half squared, we get one quarter, one half. So this gives us three. And of course, one minus one fourth will give us three fourths, three fourths, one half. So we get three divided by, again, the square root of three, and then the square root of four, which is two. So this gives us three times two divided by the square root of three. And of course, the square root of three absorbs into the three to give us square root three, so we get two root three. So again, when it comes to doing these examples, this is exactly what you did in calculus one. So every time we learn some new derivative formulas, we'll do some more tangent lines, even though you thought you probably left that behind in, in calculus one. And so now we can apply the point slope so we can uh, achieve this form. So this will imply that we have using our point. So we have, let me just write this down, M or slope is two root three. And our point is one half pi over two. So then we have y minus pi over two equals, in this case, our slope two root three times x minus one half. So we can reduce this. So we have y equals transposing pi over two plus two root three times x. And then of course, we'll have uh, minus two root three times a one half, just factoring the negative. So we have y equals two root three times x plus pi over two uh, minus root three. Now this is an exact rendition, and so you wouldn't need to approximate any of this. One thing that I often remind my uh, pre-calculus students about with the web assign, uh, all answers are deemed to be exact unless there is request for an approximation, and then the number of decimals will be provided. Otherwise, you write everything exactly using your square root symbols, using pi uh, from the uh, table of, of Greek letters that, that will pull out that you can use to write all of your symbols exactly. So again, the, the, the request in the web assign is that you assume all examples provide for exact responses and only make an approximation if the approximation is requested. The, otherwise, the, the answer will be deemed incorrect. So do not assume an approximation unless it's requested. And if it's not, then you are uh, required to give an exact response using the symbols uh, that you'll have at your disposal. So this will help you in your physics classes and also in your engineering classes uh, where you'll have to type exact responses. Approximations are very worthy and certainly needed in STEM. Uh, don't get me wrong, but, but I want you to be able to give a nice clean answer uh, when it is uh, requested of you. And so that will be the assumption throughout the class. The exact answer is always requested unless the approximation is directed. Okay, now here are some examples um, that I wanted to talk about with some integration problems. Um, there are several examples in your web assign that you can practice on. 
uh, with derivatives and also with the ebook, you have a great Larson book upon which our class is based, provides you with additional examples. And a lot of times I go to the ebook and look for a, additional uh, problems to do for lectures. So, so you have plenty of examples of including practice test examples uh, to keep yourself very busy. So, so always do plenty of plenty of problems. Now, I just wanted to do a couple of examples that are fairly straightforward, but maybe just give us some practice uh, with some of our integrals. Okay, and so the first one that I want to do here um, is the following example. So here's an integral problem. And let's see what we have. Um, let's look at this one. So we'll have the integral one, and we have uh, x, and we've got the square root of x to the fourth minus four dx. Now, when we think about examples, when in 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 course you remembered from um, calculus one, the integrals were always a little bit more demanding. So now what we can do is think about the new formulas that we have. And of course, if the new formulas work fine, otherwise you use an old formula. So don't, don't think that, that just because you can't use a formula we derived today that you're missing the problem. No, you, you don't want to force the formula when it doesn't apply. So when we look at this, we think this is closest to the inverse secant that we derived initially. So first, what we want to do is make it a little bit more user friendly and, and just write the squares that we would have. So let's to that end, we can write one. And if you like, instead of the square roots, you can use brackets. So we have x. And we can write x to the fourth as x squared quantity squared and four as two squared. Like this. So this kind of gives us an idea of, of the form that we're recognizing, the pattern that we're recognizing. So now we can look at this and say, okay, if this is the inverse secant form, we can say u equals x squared. And now, of course, the a is 2. a squared is 4, a equals 2. And then, of course, du is 2x dx. So this is exactly what we had when we did our derivation. But now what we want to see is in, in the place of dx, we need a 2x dx. And then, of course, if we notice here, uh, that two can be counterbalanced by the two that we're going to need uh, uh, here. So, so, so the idea, the idea with with all of this, or excuse me, the x squared that we're going to need here is that usually with the inverse secant, there's a small amount of adjusting that can make the problem work. So let's do that. So now, in place of the dx, we replace two x dx. And then, of course, we can pay for the x by additional copy of x here, so x squared. But we don't need the 1 half, so let me get rid of my equal sign, a little more space here, and then pay for the 1 half or the 2 here with a 1 half. And then, if you will, we'll go ahead and write the radical x squared squared minus two squared dx, and we have the dx there. Now notice this is table ready. Let's just check everything. The, the twos absorb, and then the x's here absorb. So we get exactly what we started with. But now this is table ready because now we've got the du, if you like, 
I mean, the problem's done. Here's the du. Here's the u. Here's the u squared. And here's the a squared. So this is what we call table ready. So now we're good to go. Our formula is one over a inverse secant of u over a plus a constant. But notice we already have the one half here. So we have one half times one over a, one over two inverse secant. And then of course we have the absolute value of x squared over two, even though we don't need to keep it since the x squared is non-negative plus a constant. So, so if the absolute values are not required, it's not incorrect to put them in. And if you left them out, there'd be no difference. So, so if you want to retire them in this case, you can. So now we get one half times one half, one fourth inverse secant x squared over two plus a constant. So when you think about examples like this, how much work we have to do just depends on how much gift we've been provided by the problem. In this particular example, it was fairly straightforward. We're thinking we're gonna have to use the inverse secant form, and then we can make some adjustments simply by first noting what the A and the U would be and then making adjustments with the differential that end up helping us with this. So again, the, the formulas that we use are basically just pattern recognition. And that's what we're gonna do a lot more of as we uh, continue through. Uh, you can think about these formulas as putting them in the back pocket and always remembering them and not doing too much work later on when you learn newer techniques uh, because you don't wanna, you know, reinvent the wheel every time you see a, a, a integral. If you learn a new technique, just remember that if an old one is quicker and faster, then we still want to use that. Now let's look at another example. Let's do one that uses the inverse uh, tangent. And here's an example. So we have E to the 2x, and then we have 4 plus e to the 4x dx. Now, when you think about these examples, again, let's just remind ourselves with this example, du a squared plus u squared, one over a inverse tangent or arctan u over a plus a constant. And what's the last one we just used? We used integral du, the user-friendly version. We have u square root, u squared minus a squared, equals one over a inverse secant or arc secant absolute value u over a plus a constant. So those are the formulas that we're thinking about. And while we're at it, let me just go ahead and remind you of the inverse secant or inverse sine formulation. It looks similar to this. I mean, if you've worked with the inverse hyperbolic functions, they look similar to this and we will actually encounter them with different techniques. And remember, and this does not have the one over A factor. Okay, so that's what we've been using. I didn't wanna just kind of break away, but just to kind of remind you to have everything in one place. Now, when we look at this, we see the absence of a radical. So we're thinking, well, this, maybe we can rig this for the inverse tangent form. So first what we can do 
is write e to the 2x and then go ahead and figure out what an a and a u would be in this case. So we have a two squared plus e to the 2x quantity squared dx. So this looks like an excellent candidate uh, for this formula. So now what we can see is that the u is e to the 2x and the a is two. So we can say a equals two and then u equals e to the 2x. Then of course, du is two e to the 2x dx. Now, when you look at this, you're thinking, well, this isn't as complicated as the last one, even though the last one wasn't very complicated. We didn't have to do that much work. It's just without the radical, uh, there's just less and there are fewer U's hanging out. So now what we can do is say, okay, let's make this table ready. Uh, we need a copy of two in the differential, which we don't have, but everything else looks good. So we can say two E, to the 2x dx, go ahead and move the dx into the numerator. And then of course, pay for that too, using linearity, and then two squared plus e to the 2x quantity squared. So now we have exactly this form. We have our one half, which comes along from the anti-differentiation process. We have our du, we have our a squared and a u squared. So this is what we call table ready. So a lot of times I'll say table, table ready. That means that if we were using an integral table, we're good to go. We can just fill it in. That means that we've crossed all the t's and dotted all the i's and we've made sure that our coefficients are right, just like using an integral table. That's exactly what we're doing here. We, by the time we get to the integral tables, you already know how to use them. <laughs> So, so that's what I want to try to prepare you for as we move through the class. So now let's go ahead, just like we did on the last problem, we have the one half that's already hanging out. And then the formula says another uh, one half, one over A. So we have one half and then inverse tangent of U E to the two X divided by two plus a constant. And so now just to clean this up, one half times one half will give us one fourth inverse tangent e to the two x divided by two plus a constant. Now remember when you do uh, your web assign, uh, the constants of integrations are uppercase c's, okay? If you're doing a derivative or anything, then, then they will often request that you use an uppercase C. So that's important. You can't use a lowercase C, you can't use another letter. And if the integral is given in a particular variable, you must use that variable if it's the computer algebra system's gonna check. You know, I know how a lot of students will say, well, I'm just gonna use X, I love X, even though there's a T here. Um, Maybe don't do that. Be, be sure to utilize the uh, variables that are given to you because the web assigned computer algebra system, which is highly sophisticated, uh, one of the best, if not the best that exist in academia. Uh, it was created at the university state, actually North Carolina State University, which is the sister school to the University of North Carolina where I attended as an undergraduate. So they knew what they were doing. And Cengage finally bought that system. And so now Cengage owns WebAssign. But be sure to respect the variables and, and what they say in formatting. It, it will make your life a lot easier. And I, I understand frustration can be the case, especially when you're tired. And sometimes the best thing to do is take a 10 minute nap and then, then go back and work some more. Okay, now for the last example, and then we'll uh, do some more examples next class. I just want to do a definite integral just to remind you of that. So here's a simple example. Sometimes it just has new things in it 
and, but it's really a calculus one exercise that we can do because we know some new uh, derivative formulas. So let's look at this one. So we have zero, one over root two. Uh, the integral in this case, inverse sine of x divided by the square root of one minus x squared dx. Now, again, th this is like when we get to integration by parts, you're thinking, oh, do I need some fancy uh, technique that you haven't taught us, Professor Ron? I'm like, no, th this one's good to go. Notice if the u is the inverse sign, then the differential is right here. So no, we can say u is inverse sine of x and du is now just one over the square root of one minus x squared dx. Okay, so now we can write this in a user-friendly way. So we have zero, one square root two, write this first, inverse sine of x, and then times the differential, dx square root one minus x squared. So this is what we call table ready. You have u du. So this is add one divided by the new power. So, so what's interesting about this particular problem is that this is just a basic calculus one integral that now we can do because we know the derivative of the inverse sine. So again, add one divided by the new power. So we have inverse sine of x quantity squared divided by two integrated zero, one over root two. So again, sometimes the problems are so easy, they seem difficult. So now we can do our fundamental theorem. We have a one half. And so we have inverse sine of one over root two quantity squared minus inverse sine of zero quantity squared. So this is where we get to use our unit circle. So of course the inverse sine of one over root two is just pi over four using the unit circle. So this will be pi over four quantity squared. And then of course the inverse sine of zero using the unit circle is zero. So we have one half, and this will leave us with what? Pi squared over four squared, which is 16 minus zero. So this will give us pi squared two times 16, 32. So, so the idea here is that when you do these types of problems and you think about what it is we're doing, um, not all the examples will, will require elaborate techniques. Sometimes it's just a matter of like, oh, that's just a basic add one divide by the new power. Um, that's fine. Uh, I just know the derivative of inverse sine now so I can do this problem. So, so basically, as we add more and more techniques and new ideas, basically rehashing what we already know, we're gonna practice with it, but it's not necessarily gonna mean that we're starting from scratch. So what I will do today, uh, I do have one conference hour today. I'll send out invitations for that. You may be a little bit blasted by all the stuff we did today. And then of course, I will continue to, to send out um, uh, invitations for conference hours. And, and then of course, as you check your Blackboard, uh, you'll be aware of the things that are due each week. And then, of course, on WebAssign, 
the due dates for homework and quizzes are all clearly stated. So I'll remind you of that, but this will give you an opportunity to work on things and then the homework and the quiz will be due in the following week. And what I've tried to do this term is give you a little extra cushion uh, before the things are actually due. So maybe not right at the beginning of the week, but more towards the middle to give you a little bit more flexibility uh, with your other classes. Because I know you're busy with, with your science classes and, and you're probably taking some engineering with my colleague, Nate, and that's a, that's, those are wonderful classes. You'll learn quite a bit and be supremely ready for the university. But I wanna thank you for your attendance today. Again, remember uh, later on today, I will do a download of our lecture and all lectures will be posted on Blackboard so you can review as you need to. So everybody stay well, uh, drink plenty of water and uh, good luck as you uh, get uh, assimilated with the class. If you have any questions, come to my conference hours or you can send me a web assigned message or email. I always get back to my students as quickly as I can. Everybody have a great day. And if I don't see you at conference hours, uh, I'll see you at our next lecture. Bye everyone.